we've now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. The full recording and a copy of the slides will be posted later today at cideresearch.ca, uh, where we're gradually building up the full archive of 20 years of CIDR sessions. If you have research you would like to share with the CIDR audience in our 2024-25 season, we'd be happy to have you aboard. Visit our site for more information and to contact me. And with that short introduction, I'll pass the microphone now to you, Dr. Rory McGreal in Edmonton. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Rory McGreal. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction, uh, Dan. <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about micro-credentials, uh, blockchain, and artificial intelligence in education, and specifically uh, how it support it can support education for all one of the strategic development goals of uh, UNESCO. Well, the changer isn't working. Oh, there it is. OK, now I've got it. Uh, note that uh, uh, all the slides are licensed under uh, Creative Commons. However, some of the images are uh, fair dealing, are, un are used under fair dealing for research and education. So what I see is the challenge uh, for the 21st century for educators is that uh, uh, by next year, uh, this was predicted in uh, 2015, but by next year there'll be about 100 million new students um, capable of post-secondary education, but won't be able to access it. And uh, John Daniels uh, back then predicted that we'd have to build four universities per week of about 30,000 students each in order to meet this demand. And of course, we know that's impossible. And so uh, uh, really what we, uh, what we need to understand is that we have to do this online and we have to look at ways of having mass education uh, in order to allow all of these uh, students to experience a post-secondary education. And that's the key. How do we educate all of these learners? And we do that as part of uh, my responsibilities as a, uh, a UNESCO chair, as we support the strategic development goal for quality education for all. And one way of supporting this is uh, the implementation of uh, micro-credentials, which are sometimes called alternative digital credentials, badges, uh, mini degrees, nano degrees, micro certificates. All of these uh, uh, terms are used for micro-credentials and uh, uh, all of them are based on short courses. And uh, that's what they all have in common. And the other thing they have in common is this, that micro-credentials are for credit. If not, they are not credentials. So sometimes uh, people get uh, uh, a badge for uh, an activity completed and there's no credit going with it. And uh, that wouldn't be a micro-credential. So some badges do have credit, and so they would be uh, uh, a micro-credential. So uh, in the credentials rethink, why? Uh, well, employers want qualified workers. Uh, students want job opportunities. Employees want chances of promotion. And society uh, wants economic balance. They want to make sure that the needs of the uh, workplace match uh, the skills of the uh, people in society. And uh, D, um, uh, Belshaw tells us that uh, blockchain plus badges equals the rocket uh, uh, fuel for ver verified trusted credentials. So if we can mix uh, blockchain with these credentials, um, it'll help them uh, to grow and become uh, uh, more uh, 
more usable. Um, blockchains are certifications and uh, um, they even uh, hold the transcripts. So uh, before you had the separation, you had your diploma and you had to, you had to send away to the university for transcripts. And uh, with, uh, with certification, you can have both in the one system. So the present systems are cumbersome and inefficient. You have to send uh, to the university and the university send it to the employer and uh, um, uh, the learner lacks control over the process. Um, the inability to provide a certificate is serious. And that has happened and I've known that with uh, many people who uh, they ask for a certificate from their home country when they've immigrated to Canada and they can't get it. And uh, the system is different there and they don't deal in the same way with them and it becomes a real problem. So digital systems can help. And uh, uh, Placholt calls it the death knell for the embossed transcript is uh, when we talk about a digital system for for the uh, transcripts. And of course, uh, credentials, it's really essential that they are stackable. People need a stackable credentials pathway so that uh, you, you, you gain these competencies, uh, you gain this knowledge uh, using courses or modules, you get badges that are recognized and they lead, you put a number of badges together and these lead to a certificate and then, or a diploma and then to a degree. And uh, um, uh, the idea of having orphan badges is prob problematic. We need to make sure that there's a framework for uh, assessing and accrediting each badge, each micro-credential that uh, uh, comes forward. And we can do this uh, with blockchain. And blockchain is a distributed ledger that provides a way for information to be recorded and shared by a community. So uh, you get uh, um, the accreditors of, uh, of, of the credential and uh, it can be taken by employers, by the students, by the teachers. The teachers can provide the can credential in the blockchain and the, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the institution uh, uh, verifies it and it can then go to the employers and students. And it's just uh, uh, the typical old fashioned ledger, except now it's done digitally and it's distributed. It's not in just one place on the internet. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, all over there's multiple copies of the ledger and they're stored on different computers and bitcoin is the best example of this another one is ethereum and it's based on a distributed ledger or rather it's a specific kind of distributed ledger uh, and that's a blockchain so it's not a, it's not controlled by anyone it's shared in a, uh, a P2P network and it's acceptable, accessible from any node on the network. It facilitates two or plus people to collaborate among themselves and with no centralized authority. The records are validated in blocks and each new block contains a hash of a previous block creating a chain. And it, altering earlier blocks alters the hash and breaks the chain. So you cannot change the previous blocks. You can add information to the block, each block in the chain, but you cannot alter the original. And uh, you see below there a, a, a typical uh, block in the chain. And uh, it's what happens on the blockchain stays on the blockchain. So that means it can't be deleted or changed. Transactions 
are easily traced. They're organized chronologically. They're time stamped and there's no need for a third party to control them. So on the web, the blockchain, it's decentralized, distributed, immutable, secure, and it's time stamped. And you get certification by blockchain. The, uh, the school, the issuer issues the uh, credential. They send the certificate. The certificate is uh, shared. There's a verification service in the blockchain and uh, um, the uh, student can then use the blockchain uh, to have verified, to have control over verified credentials. And the student can have a wallet for their academic credentials. And for example, like Bitcoin does, uh, you can pre-create and share keys and you can destroy them. Uh, one of the problems with uh, keys, uh, it requires a higher level of trust in institutions. The certificates are only useful when tied to a person and the privacy of the data is essential. Ownership and control belongs to the individual, not the institution. This is an important aspect of, of, of the blockchain. You own it, not the institution. Preservation, it preserves a record. It's valid, it uh, maintains its validity, and it's reliable, you can depend on it. However, there are some problems with blockchain. It's a big system, so it's prone to unexpected failures. And uh, universities might ask, why change a system that works? Why move to blockchain when uh, you move to blockchain when we've got everything working the way it is now in our analog way of doing things or uh, partially digital way of doing things, why change? And another problem is that the encryption is, pe uh, is permanent. You can't lose the key. It can't be, um, you, you have to be very careful uh, uh, how you guard your key. Other problems is with the persistence. If it's persistent, if fake content gets out there about you, it stays. Uh, there could be illegal content. Um, it could simply be unwanted content where you want to change your, uh, uh, your profile. And uh, uh, it could leak uh, uh, personal data. Other problems, well, there's the cost of uh, maintaining the network. The transaction speeds are lower with blockchain. Storage, there has to be storage in a distributed areas and distributed nodes. Um, there's a good, chance of regulatory intervention. And up to now, uh, there's no useful apps. There's some that are nearly there, uh, but there's none that can uh, really, it's, it's still experimental. They still have not uh, put together a reasonable uh, blockchain for certification at, uh, uh, at the post-secondary level. And of course, uh, uh, the system could be hacked. And another big problem is the uh, energy use. Uh, you can see on the left, a, if you just have a simple server, um, very little energy. Uh, a centralized system has a bit more. An enterprise blockchain has a bit more than that, but some of them, public blockchains uh, and uh, others are uh, huge consumers of uh, uh, of energy, and so we need uh, uh, we need to find ways of uh, reducing that. Access and affordability are important. It needs to be inexpensive when it's needed by the learner. Um, we cannot uh, have huge costs associated with it. 
So blockchain, it solves the centralization issue. It's distributed. Um, it can be a network of trusted entities. Uh, these are gatekeeping nodes. Um, access to content is with a public key and verification and validation is based on quality. The OER distributed management platform. So this, uh, um, um, we're looking at uh, using open education resources and distributing uh, management. So there's user management, uh, resource creation. It can be used for resource management, copyright management. It could be a virtual currency exchange and learning certification management. So blockchain can be used to manage um, all of these uh, different processes. So certification and learner control, should learners be able to choose what history they share with others? This is an important issue is uh, um, if you're applying for one job, you may want to amplify this part of your portfolio and not even mention this other part of your portfolio. And uh, uh, with blockchain, it's all there. And uh, so how, how much control can you have to choose what history that you share with others? You use different narratives for different purposes. You can highlight you need to be able to highlight or hide different experiences. And uh, uh, you need to uh, be able to use it for prior learning assessment and recognition. And some things you may want to show, other things you don't want to show. And uh, uh, that is a problem that uh, we need learners to be able to control this. Another problem is what happens if a student wants or needs a fresh start? And Audrey Waters uh, uh, tells us that gains afforded by the immutability of the data are, un are undetermined by problems that are left unresolvable because of that same immutability. So um, it's a problem uh, if, if students can't change that. And, that the information is immutable. And it can be used blockchain for disrupting and democratizing education. Uh, it can be used again for awarding qualifications, licensing and accreditation, the management of student records, the IP management payments, management and payments, permanent distributed record of institutional output, and its uh, reputation. Problems for higher education institution is, uh, can it dis disintermediate disinter inefficient, opaque, and hierarchical centralized systems? So uh, again, institutions that don't want change, uh, this can uh, uh, totally uh, displace the hierarchical systems that have been put in place. The higher education institution, now they make money out of verification of credentials. And once it's put out in a blockchain, they need not be involved in the verification process. Informal learning can also be verified like formal education. And so um, these are problems that higher education institutions need to uh, look at. Uh, Again, the blockchain certification allows freedom for learners to enroll in and complete courses at institutions of the learner's choice, to change institutions as they strive to complete a program or programs, to transfer credits among institutions nationally and internationally, and to have prior learning assessed and accredited. And again, the frameworks need to be created in order uh, for this uh, blockchain certification world uh, to work. The European Union has uh, uh, put this together. They, uh, the block, they say that blockchain will end paper-based certificates, 
automate the award, recognition and transfer of credits, increase learner ownership and control over their own data, reduce institutional data costs and risk, and risk but only, only if open standards are adopted. So again, the framework must have open standards that can be used uh, uh, um, by, the, uh, by the different institutions and the students and uh, uh, personnel who work in them. Sorry, Rory, we may have lost your sound. Oh, OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, artificial intelligence has a place in this with blockchain and with micro credentials. And uh, AI benefits to the students is uh, it can support equality, uh, personalization, inclusivity, and it's open. And uh, um, using AI content up to now in common law countries, it is public domain. And so you can use it um, any way you want. AI benefits are in administration. It can automate and simplify transactions. It can increase efficiency and did with digitalization. It can tra use to track students. It uh, as allows for consent management and uh, it can uh, aid security and detect tampering uh, with the system. And uh, for instructors, it can verify learning outcomes, discover skill gaps, it can discern learning difficulties, and again, it's open and available for use uh, by the instructors. However, the limitations there, need, there is a need for large computer resources for this to work. Ethics and broader context. Um, uh, again, what we were discussing earlier, John, about the uh, biases that are endemic in it. And of course, the uh, human control. Uh, there needs to be some human control and an off an on off switch. Uh, needs to be made available. And blockchain can be used as a kill switch to, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, AI can be used to uh, put a kill switch onto blockchain. And uh, if it's getting out of hand and uh, people want to change it, there's a way of doing that with the uh, blockchain. Now I'm just showing you here some of the images uh, uh, that I've created. Uh, using blockchain, so uh, it's amazing uh, what can be done. I have I have zero artistic talent, uh, so there's no possible way I could have uh, created any uh, any images like this on my own. And uh, here is a table created by blockchain, uh, micro credentials comparing micro credentials blockchain and artificial intelligence. And again, uh, um, with specifics uh, added uh, uh, in, into, the, uh, into the request, and uh, um, this is what it came up with. And I, I've looked, I looked at it very closely. I've made a few changes, but very little. It, uh, it's amazing what it can do. And uh, um, uh, what I like about it even also is that I couldn't have made as neat a a box uh, a box uh, table as uh, uh, as it did along with uh, all of the information that was put in there, which uh, to me was uh, really valuable. So the future is now. Uh, we can have an open credential service, but we must have credible local accreditation. That's important. Micro-credentials can be used 
for affordable learning for all using blockchain, artificial intelligence, and of course, openness. So I'll finish the talk with that and we can uh, uh, have a discussion about uh, these uh, three phenomena or uh, continue our discussion about AI. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Rory McGrew, um, UNESCO and ICD Chair in Open Educational Resources and Professor at Athabasca University, uh, Editor of the Open Access Journal, the Institutional, uh, the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. Okay, so we are into the uh, Q&A session. Um, so if you want to grab the microphone or post in the chat, you are welcome to do so. And just a reminder that uh, you'll find these slides and uh, recording of today's session at uh, cideresearch.ca. The question of um, persistence, uh, you know, that that came up in, and you mentioned um, in the chat, John, um, that uh, you know, what happens when standards change or fall into uh, disuse. <sighs> One of the one of the things we do with our MOOCs is we do provide them with certificates. We're not really um, tied that closely to the institution. Um, so the certificates that we provide uh, are persistent as long as we maintain enough goodwill to keep them uh, online. Um, and that the moment that uh, you know we no longer feel like supporting that or that can't afford to support that or the technology falls apart, um, those certificates are gone. And uh, we have had people come back years after the MOOC um, asking for their certificates. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the question is, uh, if you go to blockchains, um, does that actually improve the situation? Does it make it more challenging? Um, you know, I mean, if it's out on the blockchain, is it there forever? And no one really does have to maintain it? Or, uh, you know, what what's the standard of that? And is it better than just relying on non-institutional or institutional adjacent uh, goodwill? Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, 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 I, every now and then I look at lists of abandoned blockchain projects um, and they, they are, I, I, they, they, they number in the hundreds. Um, not as many now as they used to be because not as many people are, are doing new blockchain projects. I think, I mean, Rory put his finger on it, I think, in saying that there need to be standards. Uh, and but but standards themselves um, become um, redundant or 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 useless. I mean, for instance, you know, email is a wonderful standard that's been uh, uh, persisted for more or less SMT more or less thing towards fifty years now. Um, but you couldn't actually send an email successfully using nothing but SMTP anymore because there's a whole host of other things thrown in on top of it that, um, I mean, I mean, yes, the servers will accept your request probably, uh, at least if you, if you don't want encryption, um, but they, they, they won't, it, it won't turn up in anyone's inbox. And, and uh, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a concern with, with almost every technology standard that you wind up with a whole bunch of, of bits and bytes on your computer that that's absolutely nothing you can do with them. Um, I have documents that I wrote 30, 40 years ago, um, that I think would be really interesting if I could get at them, but not a single a single application that's capable of reading them um, uh, but it, it, those don't matter too much credentials on the other hand probably do and yes i would uh, uh, agree with john that it's just not there I, uh, as as i was uh, uh, i mentioned it in one of the slides um, there's a we've got a long way to go before we get anything. And uh, it is uh, for sure, it's littered, not just uh, 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 not just in blockchain projects, but blockchain in education projects, it's littered 
with those as well, and they're not uh, going forward. And uh, I certainly would not advise uh, Athabasca or any institution I was advising uh, to go ahead with this uh, unless they got a huge grant to experiment with it and to try it out. And that's what's been happening is uh, a, a lot of places have got uh, 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 very large grants, I think, in, in Malta in, uh, in specifically uh, became the blockchain island and they got a lot of European money uh, to experiment with it. And uh, I'm looking at it now for about six or seven years and they still don't have anything there. So uh, uh, again, it's good for us to stay away from the bleeding edge and uh, to look, yes, there is potential in this uh, technology, uh, but to be uh, uh, very careful about uh, uh, implementing it and wait for an application that's been tested. Yeah, and we're also, it's worth bearing in mind that um, it, it, we're still probably a decade or more away from the point at which all public key encryption becomes useless, but it will. Um, that's definitely going to happen. And, and it, 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 as long, I mean, it, it, it's not going to be a terrible problem with things like banks because we have countermeasures and ways of improving things. But when you've got something which, which is a static certificate from, from now in, say, 10 or 15 years time when quantum computing will be able, uh, computers will be able to break PKI with, with, in, in seconds, um, that's... The, it gets messy. Uh, again, you know, persistence is such an important thing with a certificate. That's why uh, paper remains moderately okay in some ways. Uh, and perhaps the answer is that we have paper and we have uh, the, the blockchain certification, or, or we have some other persistent means of, of getting at stuff. Yeah, and I also worry about what happens. I mean, given the fact that they are immutable, what happens if, if the institution or the, the whoever awards it changes their mind? You know, they discover that it's actually been written by a generative AI. Um, how do how do we deal with that? Yes, uh, well, it's very difficult because uh, we've seen it with the people. Uh, uh, the most recent one was in Germany, I think of very important people being caught plagiarizing and uh, um, they don't know how to deal with it either. I mean, the, that thesis is online and it's, it's, uh, it's been there and it's almost impossible to take it offline uh, even as it is. So this would make it even more difficult as uh, uh, for the persistency. So uh, yes, that, that is a, a, another major uh, hurdle. Uh, but I don't think it's just a hurdle for blockchain. I think it's a hurdle uh, uh, in in uh, in general. Well, except when we've got centralization in some form, then we've got the uh, um, we can publish retractions and and we can um, when people send us something to say, is this person really got a certificate? We they can send something back that confirms that yes, they have. Um, they uh, have, but it's been retracted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but so so it, it, there is. A, it's a complicated thing, I think, with certificates because it's not something which is te which is really owned by the person who receives it. It it, it is a joint ownership um, by the. It's it's a contractual thing. It's a thing saying this institution certifies that, and um, it's also something that I can pin on my wall. But in, in, it's 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 kind of like I've got a license to use it rather than that it's a thing that I possess as a useful thing in its own right. It has no value without the relationship that it has with the whoever awarded it. Um, and if I, these um, verification systems are using artificial intelligence, do we run the risk of um, hallucinating credentials? at some point um yes that's that's definitely a, a risk i mean there's no uh, limit to the ingenuity of uh, some people and uh, of how they can uh, um 
fake things and there's a lot of it going on and uh, um, I think uh, what's that uh, most uh, recent one the the woman who wrote the book about whiteness that she was caught plagiarizing just uh, uh, had a great reputation and suddenly we find out that she plagiarized uh, 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 oh and it was it's about racism and she's caught plagiarizing from uh, minority people. So, so yeah, hallucinating and uh, uh, any kind of uh, deliberate, uh, 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 how can I, fraud, um, they're still with us. It's not, it's not going to end. But uh, the immutability of the blockchain is you can at least go back to the very beginning of the chain and see what the original one was. Yes, yes, there is that. I don't know whether I, I, I'm a bit puzzled about the uses of AI in, in, in the verification of this, because what it sounds to me like you're describing is a discriminative AI, not a generative one. Uh, and, and discriminative AIs, I, I would trust more than I would trust human beings, at least if they're well designed. Um, it, it, what's, I mean, all, all of what generative AI produces is an hallucination. It, it, it's um, the, it, whether it's true or not, it, it, it's something which is, is it's effectively hallucinating. Um, so they, um, that's a, quite a different case from something that is 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 looking for patterns and things and saying, oh yeah, this is this is reliable. This is not. Um, are, are, yes, are I think it is. Approach? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's not the generative AI, but uh, it uh, AI can put a break on uh, uh, on some things. It can discriminate. Yeah, I, it's the, the, we've got uh, many, many, many decades of, of, of research into into AI systems that are enormously reliable and predictable, um, in and effective. It's uh, going back to uh, um, uh, Dave Whittington did a wonderful thing with uh, back in the nineteen nineties with a, a system that would would mark. Uh, student essays with greater reliability and consistency than than human markers. Um, that sort of use is is kind of reliable. I mean, I had my bother with that and my bother with with the generative AI stuff is that it could, it can only do things with what it has learned to do, which is to so, so it's always looking back into the past. Uh, it's not, uh, although it, it can appear to be extremely creative and by creativity indexes goes up in the top, the top 1% of human beings for creativity. But that's because the measures of creativity are stupid. Um, they're based on the assumption that we are human beings. Uh, and, and if you're not a human being, then the measure doesn't work. But uh, the, the Part of the problem with the whole sort of model collapse thing is is the, the that um, it, we it, they produce wonderful work, but it is work that is only what could have been achieved before. It's just that it has achieved something that by assembling stuff from from what everybody else has done could have been done. It can. You know, it, it, because it has no no goals, no purposes, no no identity, no values, it, it doesn't reach into the future. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but just raising it well, as a concern. Well, I'd suggest, and in my experience, is that uh, yeah, uh, yes, that that is correct. But when it puts things together, things that you know and puts them together in a different way or puts a different slant on it, 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 it helps you to generate um, new ideas and uh, to look at things in a different way. And so I think in that sense, it's very powerful. And uh, um, even sometime when it comes in, it's obviously uh, an error, it's incorrect, it's, uh, you don't agree with it. Even that can help you to think of, you know, how did this, how did they come about with that? And it, it, it gets you going. And, uh, and so in that sense, it's a, 
it's a help to uh, uh, to to researchers in uh, in having that as a tool. Yeah, it, 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 it's a hell of a lot faster and it remembers a great deal more than I could ever remember about the subjects that I know quite well. Um, so, so yes, it's, it, it, but, but we're, we're able to do this because we come from a, a past where we were the ones who were doing it. I, I guess the concern is that as we move into the future, then we have people who have learned, who have not learned the things that we learned. And... Um, less able to do that kind of assembly because you know, it's like the, the the drawing i mean i've every picture and every slide I've, I've produced for every presentation for the last few years now has been produced by some kind of generative ai i don't because i've accepted that i will never learn to be able to draw but it's the same thing I, I, my my seven-year-old grandchild uh is also using these things and they are uh, they they are learning to draw I and mean, they spend a lot of time drawing it. they like drawing and um, but there again you know they're still part of that old generation at the age of seven um where it hasn't been the ubiquitous way in which that kind of creation is done i i i i i, I, I know i'm being a bit of a fuddy-duddy and it's very much like socrates mourning the the, the invention of writing um because it is you know what what we gain with generative ai is it is a step ladder up to achieve things that we couldn't possibly achieve on our own and that's a wonderful thing but in the process we also potentially i think lose or at least diminish the skills that we would have learned had it not been that a generative AI had done it for us. And those are not, it's not like the simple ones, like remembering it. It's the, the complicated ones, like drawing things creatively. Well, but this, this is the human condition, is when something new comes up, you abandon the old, uh, the old way of doing things. I, I think uh, Marty would be the only one here who would know how to harness a, a horse to a cart or to, uh, for riding or something like that. Uh, the rest of us, we don't know. Well, this used to be a common skill that everybody had. And uh, um, when, I was, when I was a kid, um, we learned uh, uh, to write using a nib pen that you dip in the ink and you were not allowed to use a biro. And uh, uh, if you used the biro, they would slap your wrists because you had to learn the old way, the prop way people who use a biro don't know how to properly write. Uh, and of course it was difficult for me because I'm left-handed and writing with a nib pen when you're left-handed is very difficult. And uh, so now I don't think anyone knows how to write with a nib pen and i was just told it holding mine up I, yes i, I, I know i very You're deliberately one of the done so yeah uh, there's uh, always some yeah it's like yeah. my uh one of my sons he loves uh, uh uh records and record players and he's got all kinds of records like that's yes more there, that's there, more there are people who hang on i don't know too many people though who use a slide rule anymore I, no. I haven't seen uh, too many of that, but there are people who have who collect slide rules. Actually, it's a, a collector's item. But in so. all of those cases, what the technology did was um, uh, re replace uh, something mechanical, something where we had to follow the rules. If you know, although there are many things that with handwriting where you you can express things simply through the way in which you're writing, you know, you can see when someone's been hasty or they're a bit sad or yeah. they're, 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 whatever. But 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 mainly you know, from the point of view of, of writing down words, um, it, it, by replacing that with typeset stuff or with computer generated stuff or whatever, all we're doing is taking a mechanical process and, and, and doing it more efficiently. What we're doing with generative AI is a creative processes. 
uh, they're, they're the first technologies we've ever built that can use other technologies. They can use words, they can use imagery. Um, though that that makes them fundamentally different. It's it, it because it's not just the hard skills that they're replacing. It's not that my drafting skills are being replaced. It's that the inventive stuff that I would have done is being replaced, and and that is something which is terrifying to lose. Um, yes, it's an an exponential change. AI. Uh, compared to the other changes, is uh, um, it, 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 it blow well? It's mind blowing, really, of uh, what the possibilities are, and we're only at the beginning of it. Yeah. And uh, but uh, I, I will still say to my students, you'd better start using it because uh, if you're not using it, you're not with it. And uh, uh, I have my two sons are are in business, and they use AI all the time, and I, yeah. I can tell you, their companies would not hire anyone who wasn't familiar with AI, and they, uh, and they expect a very high degree of proficiency in using AI. So uh, um, it, the world outside of academia, our big problem is, of course, what do they, uh, our job is to get them to know something and to gain certain skills. And how do we measure that when they're using AI? Because they can, and this is a major problem for us. And uh, so far, I haven't figured much of a way around it. Uh, uh, what I've been thinking of lately is uh, possibly uh, um, oral exams. <laughs> Go back Tony. to oral exams, and then you'll know whether they know it or not. But, Only uh, a matter of time before that falls as well. That's that we, 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 uh, the fact that we have this dual role of, uh, 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 and, and, and the two roles conflict with each other, the credentialing and the teaching um, yes, is, yeah. is a major problem. But I think that, that it, it does. I love that it challenges us to do things that we should have been doing for the last hundred years, because we've known that we should have been doing them for the last hundred years. Which is that uh, uh, to focus on those soft skills, the stuff that is can can be simulated in automation, but that is not really the reason we do it. Because you know we learn the hard stuff. I mean, you you come from a language teaching background where there's a lot of hard stuff to learn. Basically, it is you need the grammar, the syntax, the the, the um, vocabulary, and all of those things. Um, and, and and for that, you know, for for teaching that, yeah, of course, an AI can do it better. Um, but if we're looking at uh, for, uh, how we solve problems and how we use the skills that we've developed there to communicate with other people, then we're in a world where um, we still have enormous value. Uh, and and that's the thing about the, the skills that it replaces. You know that what we what we're there's no point in teaching children to draw it. Okay, no, that's absolutely not true. But you know, it, it leads us to question what the point of teaching to children to draw actually is. Uh, and, and I think that's a really good question to ask, because it's not, if it's not about being able to um, draw a human hand with the correct proportions, you know, what is it? And 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 I think that we ought to therefore be be reclaiming this human stuff. I think the notion. I mean, Dave Cormier talks about that uh, uh, community as curriculum. You know that we it's that it's the value is in the human relationships that we can bring to this. How we square that with our credentialing role, I find challenging to say the least. Um, but I think there is something in possibly in that blockchain thing, which which points to ways in which we can do it, because it's all about webs of trust. It's all uh, you know. We we are essentially trusted by people to say that Rory Rory is worthy of being a doctor. Um, so we finding finding other ways of, of building those human relationships and establishing those kinds of trusts, I think, is something which we we desperately need to do. Um, and this uh, this can't be measured. 
Uh, well, no, not uh, uh, not quantitatively for sure. Um, it, it's it's t it's tacit stuff. It's stuff that, by definition, cannot be described or explained. But it's something which we all recognise because we're human beings and we have relationships with other human beings and we live in human societies. So it, it's um, we just need to find better ways of describing the the thing the, the the things that our students were able to do and I, I and i think moving away from this concept of, of of there being a set of learning objectives that are are met you know or that there are learning outcomes that have been achieved that we chose that they would they would have these outcomes those are the measurable things by definition you know instead we should be looking uh, to, to say well what else happened you know to, to be harvesting the outcomes to be um, discovering the 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 changes that happen in people's lives and ways of thinking as a result uh that that then it's it, and again you know that is something which ai would struggle with enormously uh, because um it, it just doesn't know what it's like to be human but if we can't but measure it, it is, um what we can measure are the mechanical things and that's the and stuff that AI can nothing, do better. If if there's nothing, if there's nothing between your ears but rice pudding, um, you can have all of these other human skills, and some of them are very important. Uh, but uh, you, there are certain facts, certain knowledge, certain skills you must have in order to be a professional in any category. Now, the soft skills that you're talking about are very important but they're only important is if if the uh, professional knows what they're doing has something between their ears that comes they're back not to important kids. if they don't have anything between their ears it doesn't matter how nice they are and how collaborative they are and how all of these other human skills are they're not worth anything no, but I how shouldn't does say your... that. That's a bit too harsh. They're still worth something. Because <laughs> you get fraud, fraudsters who, who don't have anything between their ears, but they have great human skills and they can con people. Yeah. But, you're, but the, com the companies that are hiring your kids uh, and uh, who would not hire people who did not have those AI skills, they're not using the, your kids' credentials to make those decisions to, to keep them or to hire them in the first place. They, they are uh, um, making use of a, a different kind of web of trust. And, and perhaps we should be thinking about being part of that kind of web of trust rather than the credentialing style of web of trust. You know, I yes, know what, student, what they do, what, great. what what they do is they give them a task to do. Hmm. In the interview, they give them tasks to do that are related to their job. And they pick the ones, the best ones who complete the tasks in an efficient and uh, correct manner. Um, that's interesting. And, but, uh, and uh, but I... that's the type of people they want. And no matter how nice you are now, uh, if you're in sales, that's different. A lot of these, uh, and we need salespeople, and they have all of these human qualities. And uh, but again, if they're not, if you're in sales and you don't sell anything, you're not going to keep the job very long. Exactly so, uh, and that is the and 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 so you know they're, 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 it's not necessarily being measured in terms you know their 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 achievement of learning outcomes isn't being mentioned uh, uh, measured as such, but they have a job to do. They they they're not doing the job. They don't keep it. Um, that seems to me like we have a mechanism. We just need to find a way of harnessing that mechanism. Um, and, and and maybe getting away from this rubber stamp for doing rubber stamp work that an AI could do just as well. Yes, that's true. Yep, AI could do it. I've I've seen some amazing uh, uh, exam exam creation, test creation from AI, and then they can mark it as well. And uh, so. Yep. So, and so yeah, the student we're no, we're we're not good we as people are not good at that type of stuff compared to AI so 
yeah. AI students okay. doing AI generated courses being marked by AI professors. Yes. Well, that's, I can they, see they, it. Let's I, just get out I of said, education altogether. But I, I said right at the beginning, you're t we're talking about a hundred million students in the world capable of post-secondary education with no access. So their alternative is not a human teacher. Mm. Their alternative, if they can le learn using a MOOC and with the help of an advisor, a, a, an artificial intelligence advisor, that is really good because they will get an education that way. Now, um, we can argue about what they're missing with the human, but uh, um, uh, to me, if to me, my my view is that if these human skills uh, were so important, why don't they use them in normal universities? Uh, uh, history. Uh, the... <laughs> why don't they use them? They're they're not used in most. Uh, the 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 courses I took, they did give a lecture and leave, and there's no the human connections. Uh, uh, and I I I say that with just some, because uh, I was in language teaching, and there it was very hands on and very human, and mm -hmm. I did have uh, very human professors who were great, and they really helped. But uh, if you look at a a, a regular university. Um, they don't have any teaching training and empathy yeah. is uh, is not one of their strong points so um can yeah. can, can ai empathize with people it can yeah, fake it can it. certainly simulate that that, yeah. that, that that far better than than humans can yeah and this is why it's such a compelling idea and of course we will do it because there's no there's there's really no choice within the context of the system that we have but we're victims here of the McNamara fallacy that we're going to that what we do is is uh, that we look for what is measurable and then we to say that everything else is irrelevant and that we or and or we we ignore it completely and eventually we say it just doesn't exist um whereas that's actually the stuff that is happening because even a terrible teacher you're learning quite a lot from you're just not learning the things that you suppose that, that that they're hoping that you would learn um you look but you are learning a whole load of attitudes and ways of thinking and beliefs about it and which is how come we get a whole bunch of professors doing the same things that their professors did and their professors before them did um, and, and and we don't get much of the way of progress well you learn what not to do <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. I've, I've learned a huge amount from terrible lectures yes uh, I, I agree with you actually I could say I, in my Fortran programming course I learned far more than I did in 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 the uh, really feely courses that some of them that I had and uh, uh, the teacher there was absolutely useless absolutely useless and uh, I went there the first day there were about 80 students in the second class there were about 40 the, the third class I was there with 20 other students <laughs> and within five five weeks there were about three or four of us there in the class because it took me that long to realize you're not going to learn anything here. And so you just spend your time in the lab. And I learned with the other students in the lab. You help and each that's... other. You have these big computer labs with 10 computers in a row. And, and they all help each other while one gets ahead in this, one gets ahead in that. And, uh, and uh, it was one of the uh, best courses I ever had. And I got an A plus in it. Yeah, it's yeah, very similar example crazy. in my book. We, we, we had no teacher for a year and we got, achieved the highest number of A's that had ever been achieved by a huge margin. It was nearly yeah. nearly double the, the number that had ever been achieved before. Um, yeah. and, and that's kind of the point, you know, it's this notion that, that teaching is, is something that teachers do uh, absent of all of the rest of the stuff that's happening around that cause, that results in the learning. And of course, what the learner does is, is, is the most important part of the teaching process process of all. So um, if finding ways in which we can create the conditions where that happens, I think, rather than thinking, how do we teach this and assess this, wouldn't be a bad starting point. 
I have this, well, uh, uh, this, 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 this terrible di di division of loyalties at this precise moment, because I noticed that in the top of my screen, it says that at 11 o'clock, the open community of practice at Athabasca University uh, it started its meeting. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we better, I, I we would... better close up. Yep. And uh, <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Don, John and uh, Marty and uh, Dan. Uh, thanks for listening to me. All right. And it's nice you. at my age to have somebody willing to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Lovely, lovely hearing from you, Rory. Thank you so yeah. much. That was great. Um, Bye. Thanks. Uh, uh, that's uh, Dr. Rory McGreal. And uh, again, to anyone who is uh, listening after that, uh, that uh, really interesting conversation um, and is interested in joining uh, us in a future CIDR session, uh, please let us know. Um, you'll find more information at our site, cideresearch.ca. We welcome uh, professional researchers, but we also welcome uh, doctoral students who are perhaps completing or near completion of their dissertations and want to share some of their information um, in a relatively uh, easygoing and, uh, um, and, and, you know, you have a full hour to discuss your ideas. So anybody who's interested in uh, sharing their research uh, in progress or completed, um, be sure to let us know. And with that, I think we can bring it to a close. So thank you again, Bye, uh, Dr. Dr. Rory McGreal and uh, and John Duran um, for, uh, for keeping that conversation going. Bye, Dan. Thank you for all you do. All right, bye.